Act One of The Money Spinner by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Money Spinner Cast of Characters Lord Ken Gussie Read by Son of the Exiles Baron Crudel Read by Todd Harold Boycott Read by Mark Nelson Jules Faubert Read by Alan Mapstone Millicent Boycott Read by Sonia Dorenda Crudel Read by Jen Broda Margot Read by Adrian Stevens Stage Directions Read by Michael Max Act 1, 10 a.m. Act 2, 10 p.m. Scene. Boycott's Lodgings, 17 Rue Beauvoisine, Rouen. Time, the present. The Money Spinner. Act 1. Scene. Harold Boycott's Lodgings, 17 Rue Beauvoisine, Rouen. Time, 10 o'clock in the morning. A large morning room, furnished in French fashion, brightly and gaudily. Walls and decorations in white and gold. At back, two windows, which open on a railed balcony overlooking the centre court. On right of stage, large double doors, closed. On the opposite side, a similar opening, leading into another apartment, closed by curtains in place of doors. Below doors right, a small writing desk and chair. In the centre, an ottoman to seat three people. Between the two windows at back, a pretty black pianette. On the top of pianette, a folded newspaper and three unopened letters. A small drugget in centre is the only carpeting. Light chairs, mirrors, gold candelabra, etc., to fill spaces. On balcony, outside left window, a small table and two camp stools. The table is laid for breakfast, prettily à la française. The sun is streaming into the room. Lively French music to open. At rise of curtain, Margot enters through doors right carrying a bunch of grapes, a melon, and a bundle of flowers. Margot is Boycott's housekeeper, and is a blunt and jovial-looking woman of fifty. She wears a blue cotton print dress with a scrupulously white cap and frilled apron. She closes the doors after her. Margot, who speaks French-English with the pronounced style of a Frenchwoman, surveying her purchases. Voila! There we are. Music ceases. She goes up to breakfast table and puts the flowers in a small vase in the centre. It is grand. Goes to the opening left and draws curtain. She claps her hands sharply and calls. Madame Millie, Monsieur Boycott, the breakfast. Madame Millicent, the breakfast. She goes off calling through the opening left, closing the curtains after her. Directly Margot has disappeared, there is a knocking outside the door's right. It is repeated. Then the doors slowly open and the head of Monsieur Jules Faubert appears. Faubert, who also speaks with the accent of a foreigner. Boycott, my friend. Are you at home? My friend Boycott, do you hear me? Receiving no answer, he enters rather cautiously and looks around. He is in black, wearing a long, tightly buttoned frock coat and a tall hat. His hair is red and closely cropped. His voice is soft and his manner stealthy and mechanical. Where is Boycott, my friend? 
ah he has not yet taken his breakfast he crosses over to the curtain's left and looks through no one to be seen boycott asked me to call for him at ten o'clock in the morning and it is now a quarter past ten by the great clock and he is not visible walking round the room inspecting the objects with curiosity yet he could not have left the house for i have been watching at the front door since eight o'clock takes letters from top of pianette besides here are his letters unopened examines them narrowly scrutinizing the writing and weighing them in his hand one mr boycott with the postmark of london two monsieur boycott with the postmark of room three madame boycott with the postmark of paris replacing letters ah uh, i have not yet the pleasure of the acquaintance of madame boycott poor soul perhaps she will know me some day going over to door right well i shall call again after breakfast my friend boycott is getting very unpunctual a bad sign a very bad sign goes quietly out right closing the doors after him as he leaves harold enters from left followed by millicent and margot millicent goes to the breakfast table on the balcony harold seats himself dejectedly on ottoman centre millicent is a pretty girl dressed lightly and tastefully harold a good-looking fellow in a dressing jacket millicent at breakfast table oh what beautiful grapes thank you margot i know madame would love them millicent sits at table margot fetches newspaper and letters from pianette coming down right of ottoman letters for monsieur giving harold newspaper and the letters as harold takes them he turns his head sharply towards door right there are footsteps on the stairs who is there i shall see millicent on balcony the sun has quite boiled the wine margot has gone to the door's right opened them and looked out harold to margot well i do not see the footsteps monsieur harold giving margot a letter give this letter to your mistress then go downstairs and ask the concierge if he has allowed anyone to pass this morning yes monsieur margot takes letter to millicent and then goes out right harold opening his letters aside the curse of these public staircases one is never free from intrusion might just as well live on the high road reading letter nothing but ill news from london nothing but dreary dreary disappointment morning after morning god help us crushes letter and puts it in his pocket opens the other of course from goreville the tyler will sue me for his account will he millicent from balcony how many letters harold one dear from whom harold opening newspaper goreville the tyler for his bill oh harold you ought to pay him yes i ought who writes to you it is father's handwriting i don't want to spoil my breakfast so i shan't open it yet what in heaven's name does your father want now millicent cutting bread a couple of my silk dresses for the rinda i'll be bound or another frock coat of yours or something to make up the rent poor dad down on his luck again i suppose yes but i wish to goodness he wouldn't be so down on other people's why does not your sister dorinda go out into the world and earn her own living and wear honest stuff dresses as other women do 
Poor Dolly is so helpless. Helpless? She is clever enough at turning the king into a corte. Oh, Harold! It is the truth. The first time that I met you at your father's house, your ingenious little sister cleared me of six weeks' salary. I don't say she could help her position, poor girl, but it is a false one. I say, let your father give up his ugly little gambling parties and go to Australia. The Baron can't dig. Baron, indeed. Well, then, if he can't dig, let him go to— uh, Where? Come, Harold, where? Well, my darling, don't insist on my allotting a destination to the Baron. It's a point on which I am likely to get a little warm. You are unkind, sir. Come to your breakfast. Harold does not pay any attention, but reads newspaper absently. Harold, aside. Suicide of a poor fellow from off the quay last night. For what reason, I wonder? It's very fine and bright on the quay at night-time. The water looks warm and soft and clear, and if a man has a trouble upon his mind— Ugh! I mustn't think of anything like that. Rises hurriedly and takes newspaper to desk right, at which he sits. Turning newspaper and reading— they were trying criminals yesterday at the court of Aziz. Who is this? Reading. Octave Bernier, a clerk, charged with embezzling the monies of his employers. Embezzlement! Good heavens! The very thing they would say if— Reading eagerly. Guilty. No extenuation. Sentence ten years. Ten long years. Poor wretch! What do his friends say? the friends who have respected him. And his young wife, mocked at by the world, scorned by those who had professed to love her. Poor girl, poor girl. The paper drops from his hand, and he sits, thinking. Millicent has risen from the breakfast table, and walks along the balcony to the window right. She now appears there with a flower in her hand, which she has taken from the bouquet on the table. Millicent, opening the window softly. Harold. He does not hear her. Come to breakfast like a good boy. She throws the flower towards him. It falls short, then comes down to him quietly and places her hand on his shoulder. What is wrong, dear? Harold, starting. Who is that? It is I, Milly. What is the matter? What are you doing? Where is Margot? Who is that I heard upon the stairs? I don't know, Harold. Are you angry with me? Angry? No. Forgive me, Mill. I was dreaming. Millicent, leaning over his chair. Don't be selfish. Have your thoughts with me. I'll buy them off you. You are a true woman, always ready to make a bad bargain. Oh, I knew something was wrong with you. For the past week you have been so anxious and careworn, have had long deep wrinkles on your poor old forehead. Tracing them with her finger. Like the tramway lines to Sonville, and ugly red eyes that look like danger signals. You are as white as the ceiling. You are silent when not muttering to yourself and you smoke two dozen cigars and eat a thimble full of food a day. There is something on your mind. Won't you tell me what it is? It is nothing, at least almost nothing. As you know, the heads of our firm are superintending the erection of another great factory at Marseille, and I am for the moment left alone in Rouen with the sole direction of many hundreds of people, and with great cares and responsibilities. I am a young man. Perhaps the position is too grave for me. At any rate, I am a little worried. Leaning his head on his hand. That is all. You have nothing more to tell me? No. Sure? Yes, I am sure. Why do you ask so persistently? Millicent kneels beside him. I'll whisper it to you. 
drawing his hand near hers. Because, although I have been married nearly two years, I am over head and ears in love with Mr. Harold Boycott, and if I thought that my sweetheart could keep a secret from me, it would break my heart. They rise. Harold walks slowly to centre. Millicent? Yes? Don't you remember your old sweetheart, the man from whom I took you when we became engaged, the man who you would have married but for your love for me? Don't you remember? Yes, Lord Ronald can gussy. What of him? I wish most sincerely that I had never taken you away from him. I wish that your love for him had been deeper than your love for me, and that you had become me his wife. With all my heart, I wish it. If you have any love for me, you won't speak to me like this, Harold. For shame. I wish it, because King Gussie is rich, and I am poor, because he is a gentleman, and I a clerk in a cotton factory, because he would have placed you beyond the reach of trials and dangers, and I, perhaps, may live to drag you down to them. Trials and dangers? Going to Harold. I knew it. Let me share your danger. I ask it as a right. Harold, kissing her. You shall share it when it comes. I wish to heaven it were a right I could deny you. Margot enters door right. Millicent starts from Harold. Margot clapping her hands. Oh, madame, I am so sorry that I enter on sea suddenly. I love to see you kiss Monsieur Boycott. Be quiet, Margot. Ah, oh, pardon me, madame, but I am a widow. If I kiss my poor Alphonse more frequently, I should now be an happier woman. Oh, I am afraid you have been gossiping, Margot. Have you asked if anyone has called for me this morning? Oh, yes, monsieur. A gentleman, a red-headed gentleman, passed up and down the stairs. He told the concierge he would return. A red-headed gentleman. Relieved. Oh, of course. Jules Forbear. To Millicent. My new fellow clerk, Milly, whom you do not know. A very good, honest fellow. To Margot. Thank you, Margot. Margot goes off right. Harold and Millicent seat themselves at table outside window at breakfast. What induces Monsieur Faubert to call for you, Harold? He seems to have taken quite a liking to me, and he said it would please him to call for me on his way to business. Do you like him? Um, I don't know. He has only been in the office about a week, so I can scarcely judge the man. At any rate, he sticks to me like a leech. Margot throws open the doors right. Monsieur Faubert. Faubert enters. Harold rises and comes down, meeting him centre. Ah, Faubert, how do you do? It is kind of you to call. Have you breakfasted? Faubert, shaking his hand. Thank you, yes. We shall be late for our duties, shall we not? What a fellow you are for work. They stand talking. Margot, at door right. I do not like Monsieur Boycott's new companion. He is soft like the cat and cunning like the fox. A noisy man is a nuisance. A quiet man is a danger. Exit right. I'll go at once and finish dressing. Pointing to newspaper. There is the piper. Goes to opening left. Oh, Millie dear. I beg your pardon. This is Monsieur Faubert. Faubert, my wife. Millicent rises, bows, and reseats herself. Faubert bows profoundly downstage right. How do you do, Monsieur Faubert? To Harold. Harold. He goes to her. You have eaten no breakfast. Faubert, aside, downstage. Madame is a very pretty woman. Her face reminds me of... Thoughtfully, tapping his forehead. Hmm, of whom does Madame Boycott remind me? He sits at writing table right and takes up newspaper. Millicent, at table left, to Harold. 
after all you didn't tell me your troubles dear i shall be so unhappy all day i was a fool to say what i did i'm a little harassed and vexed that is all Fauper, reading octave bernier a clerk charged with embezzlement no extenuation ten years good ah uh, friend octave you don't know how much of that you owe to me kissing his hand to newspaper au revoir monsieur bernier millicent to harold must you go dear fear nothing darling all is well to forbear i am going to shave forbear wait five minutes he goes off through curtains left forbear aside to shave that means a razor i hate razors three times in my life i have been frustrated by a razor it is such a sudden temptation millicent puts her head round window and looks at faubert millicent aside what sort of man is harold's new friend i wonder faubert aside gazing at newspaper something tells me i am being looked at how curious women are monsieur faubert i was right he lays aside newspaper and rises madame i am so anxious about my husband he appears sadly harassed and overworked at his business can you tell me if there is any special reason for his anxiety Faubert goes up to window left. Millicent remains seated. Faubert, aside. Ah, the fool cannot keep his own secrets. To Millicent. I regret I cannot account for it, madame. And you work with him in the same counting-house? Ah, but in a different channel. His duty leads him one way, mine another madame pardon me yes your face seems strangely familiar to me have we met before millicent looking at him i have no recollection of such a pleasure ah uh, i am wrong but a man is always dreaming sweet images and when he meets with the embodiment of his dreams he sees of course a familiar face oh thank you monsieur faubert aside i don't like this man faubert aside i have seen this woman before upon my soul i have margot enters door right madame the porteur with the luggage a porter dressed in a blue blouse enters carrying a box a miscellaneous luggage which he deposits upstage right centre margot then shows him out millicent crossing over to luggage luggage whose luggage reading labels good gracious papa and dorinda excuse me monsieur faubert running towards opening left and calling Harold, Harold, here's the family. Runs out left. Forbear goes to luggage. Papa's luggage? What is Papa's name? Reading label. Ah, mon Dieu, I was right. The Baron Crudel, passenger from Paris to Rouen. Crudel. The proprietor of a little gambling house in the Rue Saint Nicholas. The old swindler. I knew I had seen Madame Boycott's face before this morning. Diable! I must silence the Baron. If he recognizes me, he spoils my game. 
turns up stage and goes out, left window, onto balcony. Margot throws open the door right and enters. This way, Monsieur le Baron. This way, Mademoiselle, if you please. Baron Crudel and Dorinda enter. Crudel is an untidy, dissolute old man, wearing a tightly buttoned-up suit of seedy black with no perceptible linen. The breast of his coat is decorated with some orders. Dorinda is a pretty, fresh-looking girl in a rather showy travelling dress. Thank you, my good woman. Thank you. Oh, Papa, what bang-up lodgings! Dorinda! To Margot. Our quaint Mrs. Boycott, with the arrival of her father. Margot crosses to left. Say the word father very gently. For though my child expects me, still, as we have been apart for some time, too sudden a joy might prove dangerous. Yes, Monsieur le Baron. Crudel taking off his very greasy and disreputable hat. Stay. Take my hat. Margot takes it with much disgust between her finger and thumb. And don't let Mrs. Boycott see it before you announce me. The sudden sight of her father's hat might give my child a bit of a shock. Yes, Monsieur le Baron goes out left. Crudel and Dorinda sit on ottoman, centre. Dorinda lolling back. Oh, Pa, isn't this proper? No low English vulgarisms, please, Dorinda. And no humbug, please, Baron. Nudging Crudel with her elbow. Don't you feel in clover at last, Pa, dear? Why should I, Dorinda? No longer dependent for one's miserable dinner on that wretched gaming salon, eh? Hush, Dolly. No more sick headaches over that ghastly baccarat, that dreadful lansquenet, and that horrid ecarte. No more card nightmares, no more gambling. Of course not, except for our own pleasure. No more horrid men to smoke and swear while we look on smiling. No more flare-ups with the police. It is all over. No more shameful misery. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, I'm so glad. Wiping her eyes. Pa, I'll go to the English church at Sunnyville on Sunday. You see if I don't. So will I, my darling, if I'm well enough. Crudel takes out a little spirit flask from his pocket and puts it to his lips. Don't, Pa. I'll take that away from you if I see you put it to your lips again. It's only quinine, Dolly. A tonic for your old father. Forbear looks in through the window, right. Forbear, aside. I don't think my friend Boycott expected the old reprobate and his daughter this morning. Oh, mon dieu, what a family to marry. Millicent runs in from left. How do you do, Daddy? How are you, doll? Mm -hmm. My dear child, my firstborn. You're not so rosy as you used to be, Mill. Oh, I do like the cut of your dress. Turning about. I'm a swell too, ain't I? We are so astonished to see you. Didn't you get our letter? Yes, and I'm so ashamed of myself. Like a simpleton, I forgot to open it. Crudel is again drinking from the flask. Oh, good gracious. What is the matter? Knock it out of his hand, Millie. Slap him on the back and choke him. Millicent to Crudel. Don't drink that, father. I'll get you some coffee. 
My child, a little quinine, a tonic for your old father. Harold enters left, dressed for walking. Crudel embraces him. My dear son-in-law. Harold, coolly. How do you do, Mr. Crudel? Never better, dear boy, never better. Millie says she didn't open my letter this morning, so we come upon you as a pleasant surprise. You do, as a surprise. Seeing Dorinda. Ah, Dolly, how are you? I'm A-1, brother-in-law. You did not expect, when you rose this morning, that Dorinda and your old father were winging their way to your peaceful little nest, did you? No, sir, I did not, and I shall be happy to exchange a few words with you on the subject at your convenience. Crossing over to Dorinda. You are looking very well, Dolly dear. Kisses her. At your service, my dear boy. Millie, show your sister to her room, will you? Come along, doll. You must be tired. Take me upstairs and lend me your powder puff, Mill. I shall be as fresh as a lark after that. Millicent and Dorinda cross to opening left. Got any new dresses, Mill? A few. Little Madame Vautier, the new Parisian dressmaker, is building me such a rig out. I'll tell you all about it. It's a demi-train skirt embroidery down the front and round the train. Open skirt filled in with deep kilting tied across with ribbon bows. Short sleeves edged with fringe. Goes off left with Millicent, talking loudly. Light-hearted prattler. Just like her father, Harold. Just like his flow of spirits. Puts flask to his lips as before. A tonic, dear boy. A trifle of quinine. Now, Mr. Crudel. I beg your pardon, but Baron Crudel, if you please. A little matter of a title. A little matter of humbug and imposition, sir, which you will be good enough to wave with me. Seats himself at writing table, right. Now, Mr. Crudel, I want to know the meaning of this intrusion. Crudel, sitting on Ottoman centre. Certainly, dear lad. I've given up the Parisian establishment. Baron Crudel's gaming saloon in the Rue St. Nicolas is a thing of the past, over which fond memory alone can delight, and the Baron is an independent gentleman. In other words, tapping his nose, I am on another and a better game. But what do I owe your uninvited presence here? Dear lad, didn't you hear me say I have left Paris? Well? Well, I have come to Rouen. Harold, rising. To remain? To remain? What more natural than that? Having severed my connection with a turbulent capital, I should seek an asylum in the calm repose of my son-in-law's provincial establishment. Harold, advancing firmly to Crudel. Mr. Crudel, when two years ago I married your daughter, I did not in any sense of the word wed her family. I took her, I am not ashamed to say it, from a gaming house, from an atmosphere which would have poisoned the mind and contaminated the very soul of a woman an atom less pure than my dear Milly. Sir, there is contagion in moral as well as in physical maladies, and for this reason I must request that you and poor Dolly instantly withdraw from my house. Oh, Mr. Harold Boycott, I shall not withdraw from your house. You will not? Not if I can help it. 
when you married my girl, you did not marry her family, and for that you owe her family distinct reparation. I don't understand you. At the time you were sweethearting my Millie, there was a young Scotch lord after her. Dead on, Sir Bargad, Lord Kengussy, Sir, a man with a pound in his bank for every penny piece you could ever hope to scrape up. A man who could and would have pensioned off his father-in-law and made the poor old gentleman's life a bed of roses. Well, Mr. Boycott, you took my girl from this Lord Kangussy. You, the manager of a cotton factory, spoiled her chance of wealth and a title, and did not pension off her devoted old father. Well, Crittle, rising excitedly. Well, sir... This Lord Kangussy is on the hook again, is he, by gad? He lost Millie, and he is after Dolly. Dead on, sir, deader on than ever. And what is more, she is over head and ears with him, and he'll marry her in less than a year. And what have I to do with all this? Crudel seizing him by the coat. Why, if you don't stick to us, Harold, we shall go to smash. Kangasi makes it a condition that I give up my gaming table in Paris. My living, boy, my bread and meat, and give Dolly, poor girl, a twelve month of gentility before he marries her. I thought of you, son-in-law, for yours is the only respectable house I know, and you were always open-hearted when you had the coin. And Ken Gussie thought of you, too. You won't lose by it in the end. Don't throw us over. If the air of the Rue St. Nicholas was bad for Millie, it's as bad for Dolly and Dolly is as good a girl as ever breathed. Stick to us, and we shall float. Throw us over, and we are as homeless and helpless as the cur in the gutter that everyone kicks and shies at. Give us a helping hand, do, do, do. He sinks trembling and exhausted on Ottoman, and puts the flask to his lips. Harold walks slowly to right, and back again, pondering. Mr. Crudel, I'm a poor man, and at this moment I'm weighed down by certain business cares which forbid my incurring fresh responsibilities. Oh, dear, oh, dear. But, for Millie's sake, and for the sake of Millie's sister, you are welcome. Crudel, taking his hand. God bless you, dear lad. God bless you. And Gussie will turn up shortly, and he'll be delighted. Crudel is about to drink from Flask again, when Harold interposes and takes it from him. Pardon me, father-in-law, but there are one or two restrictions which I invariably impose on my guests. A little very respectable quinine. Nothing more, dear lad. The first is, brandy at seasonable times. Harold goes up to window right and flings the flask out into the court below. Fulbert is not in sight at the time. It is Lord Ken Gussie's desire that your new life be one of conventional respectability, and I shall respect that desire. If your craving for tonics is too freely indulged in, I shall be compelled to tell you that your welcome here is at an end. Under your roof we shall be respectable enough for a prince, not to speak of a Scotch lord. I must tell Dolly, I must, by gad. Dolly! 
we are to stay. We are respectable, by gad. For the first time in our lives, we're de-respectable. Hurries off left. Poor devil, I couldn't have done less. Looks at watch. How light. I dread to go to my desk, but I must not stay longer. It would appear suspicious. Forbear, who has been out of sight upon the balcony, now enters through the window right. Boycott, are you ready? Oh, Forbear, a thousand pardons. I had forgotten you. Some unexpected arrivals disconcerted me. Let us waste no more time. Goes to door right. I am ready, old fellow. Millicent enters from left, followed by Dorinda. They come to Harold. Dolly has told me everything, Harold, and Papa says that he and Dolly are to stay. Dolly wants to thank you, dear. Nonsense. Dorinda comes to Harold, wiping her eyes. Harold, dear, I made up a speech on the second floor landing. It was a very pretty speech, and I, I, I've forgotten it. Throwing her arms around him. Harold, you're a brick. You're a goose. Goodbye, Millie. I'm off. Goodbye, dear. Don't be late. No. Now then, Forbear. Forbear, up at door, bowing to Millicent. Madame. Millicent bows in return. Harold, aside. Shall I ever leave this house again with a light heart, I wonder? Takes Forbear's arm, and they go off right. Dorinda, sitting left of Ottoman. Who's your foxy friend? Millicent, sitting right of Ottoman. A new clerk at the factory. He runs after Harold. Crudel re-enters from left in Harold's dressing jacket and slippers, and smoking a cigar. I've taken the liberty, girls, of borrowing dear Harold's jacket and slippers. Going up to window, left. If there is a cup of coffee going, I don't mind partaking. Margot enters from left. Crudel intercepts her and speaks in an undertone. My dear, in the court below you will find a silver flask, which by accident dropped from the balcony. Get it refilled with the best, the very best, brandy. Make it an item of domestic expenditure. I shall not forget you. Yes, Monsieur Le Baron. Margot crosses over to right doors. Where are you going, Margot? Crudel puts his fingers to his lips. Margot does not notice him. To fetch her something for your dear papa. She goes out. Crudel sits at table on balcony. Dorinda to Millicent. I've always dropped in for your left-off goods all my life, Mill. Old dresses, old boots, old gloves. Not that I mind, dear, for you're a good sort, and an old garment is better than new when it has been worn by you. And now I've come in for your old sweetheart, Ronald Kingussie. Poor Ronald. He's soft, but he's good, like a sponge cake. Mind you are good to him, Dolly, for he's as kind-hearted as ever man was. I treated him so badly, but I'm glad you are to be his wife, because you will be able to befriend me when he runs me down. Lord bless you, he never runs you down. He always speaks of you as if you were a very valuable specimen of a museum mummy, a precious something to be talked about in whispers, and not even to be dusted by sacrilegious hands. I'll tell you a secret, Millie. What? A secret? Ronald Kengussie loves me now because he loved you two years ago. What do you mean? I'm not a bit like you, Mill. I know that. I was always no end of a rough sort, not soft and gentle as you are. But there must be something in my face which reminds him of you. Some look in the eyes or some toss of the head and he loves me for it. Nonsense, Dolly. He loves you for yourself, I know. 
I know better, and I'm glad of it. You are glad of it? Rising. Yes, because I want him to think me like you. Since you left us, I've had two more years of the little house in the Rue Saint-Nicolas, and I'm no better for it. And I love old Ronald with all my soul, because he's fool enough to look at a girl like me. Hush. Don't talk like that, Dolly. I wish he was poor so that I could work for him. I wish he was ill so that I could nurse him. I'm not clever at anything but cutting an ace now and then. But I would slave for Ronald till my hands dropped off. I would. I would. I would. Millicent kissing her. <clears throat> Dear old Dolly. I... If Ken Gussie were in rags and walking the muddy street without a shoe to his foot, I'd sit up all night to work him a pair of woolen slippers. Crudel at table on balcony. Dorinda, cut your father a slice of melon. That's right, Dad. Make yourself at home. Goes up and sits with Crudel on balcony. Millicent aside. I shall be so happy when Dolly is married. I shall feel then that we can bid goodbye to even the recollection of our old life. Harold enters quickly from door's right, closing doors after him. He comes to Millicent. Seeing Crudel and Dorinda on balcony, he speaks in an undertone. His manner is agitated. Harold! Back already? Hush! Something has happened. Something happened? Tell me, Harold, quickly. You are ill. I see it in your face. What is it? Sit down. She sits left of Ottoman, he right. Are you brave, Millie? Oh, Harold, what is it you have to tell me? Sweetheart, I promised you that when the time came you should share my trials and dangers. I have brought them to you now. Millicent looks at him and puts her hand in his. But I have not told you that when you share my dangers, you must share also my crimes. Your crimes? She withdraws her hand. My friends would designate my acts as crimes, so will the law. Millie, I have taken monies which do not belong to me, and I am in trouble. What have you to say to me? Rising. Millicent rises with him and kisses him fondly. Nothing. Harold goes over to right and seats himself at desk. When seated, Millicent kneels at his feet. Tell me about it. You know how fond I am of my young brother. You know that from the day we were both left orphans I have tried to stand in the place of a father to him. Well, Three weeks ago, I suddenly hear from him that he has lost in betting a very large sum. The money must be paid at once, or our names would be dishonoured and my brother would never be able to hold up his head again. Algy explained that five hundred pounds was owing to him from a friend, who he confidently expected would pay him in a few days. But his debtor was in Norway, and the matter would bear no delay. His only chance was that I should be able to help him. And you did, you dear generous Harold. I had not the amount. My whole savings were not nearly enough. But during the absence of the heads of the firm at Marseille, I have had the entire conduct of the factory, and the daily handling of large sums of money. Why should I not save my brother by employing part of this money? It would be repaid before the return of my employers. Who would be the wiser? Who would be the worse? Oh, Harold, and your brother has not returned the money? His friend, curse him, failed to pay him. My brother has written to him day after day, but, as I heard this morning, till now without result. Milly, darling, I am a ruined and dishonoured man. I have just heard that Monsieur Ribot, the head of the factory, returns today. Tomorrow I shall have to account for every penny which has passed through my hands. I have betrayed my trust, and I can hope for no mercy. 
Millicent takes off her bracelets and necklace and gives them to Harold. I have some more jewellery and a little money upstairs, dear. I will fetch it. She is about to rise. He detains her. My dear little wife, it is useless. Places jewellery on desk. As I told you, my debt to the firm is more than ten thousand francs. Ten thousand francs? Oh, Harold, how can we raise so large a sum by tomorrow? It is impossible. There is no hope. Millicent, rising. There is hope. There must be hope. I will get it. I will get it if I die for it. Margot enters. Door right. Lord Ken Gussie. Lord Ken Gussie enters. Margot goes out. Ken Gussie is a fair-haired, mild-looking young Scotchman. How do you do, Lord Ken Gussie? Bless me, how are you? Shaking her hand. How is Mr... Dear me, where goes his name? I've no memory. Harold advances. How do you do? Taking Harold's hand. This is an awful intrusion. But the fact is I knew Dolly was here, and I have not seen her since yesterday, and I wanted to know if she was pretty comfortable, which of course I knew she would be with you, and I wished particularly to renew my acquaintance with you and Mrs... Uh, bless me, there goes the name again. I am very pleased to see you leading him to window left. Here is Dolly and Mr. Crudel. King Gussie, aside. Yes, I thought I sent at the Baron. Harold and King Gussie join Crudel and Dorinda on the balcony. Millicent, aside, down stage right centre. Ten thousand francs, or exposure and disgrace. Money or ruin. What shall I do? Cry and give up the game as others do? Ken Gussie from upstage. You have always rosy cheeks, Dolly dear. You shall never lose them if I can help it by Jove. Millicent aside. Ken Gussie, he is so rich. He might help me. Shall I ask my rejected lover to help the man who took me from him? <laughs> I cannot. I am a weaker creature than I thought. I cannot do that. Oh, how I wish I were back in the little gaming house in Paris, in all my old misery and wretchedness, with my pack of cards. Cards? Cards? Why should they not help me? Covering her face with her hands. No, no, not again. And yet... Why not? Nothing can undo the past. Why am I so squeamish now? Ken Gussie comes down left centre. Haven't you anything to say to me, Mrs... Confound it, there goes the name again. Haven't you anything to say to an old friend, Millie? Millicent takes necklace and bracelets from table and advances to Ken Gussie. I am very pleased to see you again, Lord Ken Gussie. Sitting on Ottoman, right. Ken Gussie, leaning over Ottoman at back. Thanks. Millicent, putting on necklace. And so delighted to hear about you and dear Dolly. Ken Gussie, he arranges the fastening of Millicent's necklace. Yes, I am in love with Dolly. She is your sister, you know. Yes, I know. She is so unlike, and yet so like you. Is it very wicked for a fellow to marry a young lady because she resembles someone else? Yes, very wicked. Then I deserve to be hanged. Millicent is arranging a bracelet. She holds out her hand to Ken Gussie. He fastens bracelet. Permit me. Do you notice much change in me? 
Yes, you are very jolly and kind, which you used not to be. We grow wiser as we grow older. All wise people are kind. All kind people are not wise. Look at me. I try to be kind, and all my friends tell me I'm a regular fool. How can they be so rude? They speak the truth. I am a fool. You made a fool of me two years ago. You are not very kind now. You contrive to be much pleasanter in the old days. Yes, in the old days I never opened my mouth. Now that you are married, I can talk somehow. <laughs> How glad you must be, then, that I am married. How long do you remain in Rouen? I leave here tomorrow for Macan in Argyleshire, and Dolly is to remain in your care. Let me see as much of you as possible. Stay. I have a bright idea. I'm sure you have. This is such a happy reunion. I will give a little party tonight. A nice, quiet little family party. You are one of our family now, you know. Crudel, loudly from balcony. That's the fellow, sir. Stabbed his wife in the left lung with a carving knife, by gad. Ken Gussie, glancing over his shoulder towards Crudel. Yes, I know. Will you come? Of course. You know I will. And I have another idea. We two will have a match at Écarté. We are old enemies at cards, and I owe you your revenge. Ken Gussie, I have not played at Écarté since we two played together two years ago in the little house in the Rue Saint-Nicolas. I never was much of a hand at Écarté. But I always like to sit opposite to you in those old days. To sit opposite you and look into your face. You will play better now. Those old days have made their bow and departed. Now the face for which you used to neglect the game has lost its freshness. Don't forget, cards at ten. I shall not forget, Mrs. Ugh, by Jove! Where goes the name? Boycott. Never mind, Mille will do. I shall not forget Mille. Dorinda comes from balcony. Dorinda to Kengussie. Ronald! I beg your pardon? Pray don't make a mistake. We are two sisters. That is Millie. This is Dolly. One is married, the other single. Just so. Millicent, hastily. Dolly, dear, play something. I never play now. Do, doll. Ken Gussie takes Dorinda to the pianet and stands by her side. Millicent to Harold. Harold. Harold comes down. Harold, keep a firm, brave heart and go down to the factory again as if all were well. There is, there is hope. Hope. Dorinda plays a lively air, French, very softly on the piano. Don't ask me how or why. Leave all to me and question nothing I say or do. Millie, you are mad. Have you forgotten what I was in my father's house in the Rue Saint-Nicolas before you rescued me from its misery and degradation? Have you forgotten what they called me then because of my never-failing good fortune, because of my luck? They called me the money spinner. I shall see if I can spin now as I could spin then. No, no, Millie, I forbid it. The doors right open and Faubert enters. Dorinda ceases playing. I pardon my entering unannounced. Your servant is absent. Boycott, our Monsieur Ribot has returned from Marseille and requires to see you. Millicent, aside to Harold. Have courage. Harold, going up to Faubert. 
I am ready. Millicent, rising. Monsieur Faubert, we have a little family party here tonight. Cards and reminiscences at ten o'clock. Will you join us? Faubert, bowing. Madame, I shall be so happy. Millicent, reseating herself. Harold, introduce Monsieur Faubert. Harold, taking Faubert's arm. Faubert, my sister-in-law, Miss Crudel. Lord Kengussy, Monsieur Jos Faubert. Dorinda nods. Kengussy bows. Harold takes Faubert over to left. Dorinda aside to Kengussy. I hate sandy men. Looking at Kengussy's fair hair. Oh, I beg your pardon, Ronald. Harold to Crudel. Mr. Crudel, let me introduce you to my friend Faubert. Harold leaves Faubert left and joins Ken Gussie and Dorinda at piano. Crudel, entering from balcony. Baron Crudel, my son-in-law should have said. How do you do? Starting back with surprise. Krogan. Faubert, laying his finger on his lips. Hush, keep my secret, and it will be well for you. Forbear looks quietly at Crudel, and then goes over to right of Ottoman and speaks to Millicent. Forbear to Millicent. Madame, you will never pardon me. I am always trying to take your good husband away from you. They talk. Crudel left. Dorinda? Yes, Pa. Dorinda leaves Harold and Kengussie and joins Crudel. Crudel aside to Dorinda, trembling. Dolly, don't you recognize that fellow Forbear? Not a bit. You haven't the scent that I have. Not a word, not a whisper of what I'm going to tell you. That man is Pierre Gragon, one of the best-known detectives in the Parisian police. What of it? What of it? He is a worm with the sting of a serpent. What the devil is he doing here? He is a clerk now in Harold's factory. I suppose he has given up collaring swindlers, become one himself. She returns to the pianet and reseats herself. Harold goes to right. Crudel stands left, aghast. Are you coming, Forbear? Certainly, my friend. To Millicent, bowing. Au revoir, madame. We meet tonight. Dorinda resumes playing softly. Forbear goes up and bows to her and Kengussy speaking a few words to them in an undertone as Millicent speaks. Millicent, aside on Ottoman. Tonight, what will that bring? The money spinner and the man who once loved her so dearly. Oh, what is it I am going to do? What am I going to do? She buries her face in her hands. Faubert joins Harold. Come, Faubert. As they are leaving, the doors right are thrown open and Margot appears with Crudel's spirit flask. Margot loudly holding up the flask. She brandy for Monsieur le Baron. Dorinda bursts out laughing and plays very forte. Crudel hastily goes out through the opening left as curtain falls quickly. End of Act One Act Two of The Money Spinner by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene. Same as in Act One, night time. Windows open and bright moonlight on balcony. Doors right closed. Curtains left closed. Ottoman removed to left downstage. 
Diane Stage writes centre a small card table with green baize top, on which are two packs of cards, lighted candle with shade and small bell. Chair right and left of card table. One or two camp stools on balcony. Pianette candles lighted, also lighted candles round room. Soft, sentimental music to open. At rise of curtain, Dorinda is discovered seated on balcony outside of right window. She is dressed smartly for the evening. Crudel is asleep on ottoman down left, with his legs on a chair and a coloured handkerchief thrown over his face. He is attired in very rusty evening dress, and wears the ribbon of the Legion of Honour. Dorinda, looking at the stars. How late that old band's playing! Some big fellow's birthday, I suppose. What a jolly night for sentimental soliloquy! How beautiful the stars are! Regular diamonds of the first water! I always think that the stars are hung out to encourage good girls while the moon looks on and bullies the bad ones. The moon has such a painfully judicial air. I believe it is in the pay of the English school boards. Music ceases. Crudel snores gently. I wonder whether that is the water I hear, running through the bridges and lapping the sides of the quay. How balmy the air is, and how tight Millie's dresses are round the waist. How kind of Millie to lend me her swell dress, and how hard that I should be squeezed in on such a heavenly night. She rises and comes into the room. Pa has dropped off. She walks on tiptoe over to Crudel. Poor Pa. I hope life will run smoothly for him for the future. There is so much to admire in poor old Pa. Crudel sleepily turns up the part of the handkerchief covering his mouth and mechanically raises the spirit flask to his lips, then replaces handkerchief and drops off again with the flask in his hand, and without noticing Dorinda. Dorinda with a shudder. Oh, how horrid! Crudel uneasily in his sleep. Double on the red. No getting out of it. Oh, what a lot can be done by a twist of the wrist. By God. He is dreaming that he is back in the Rue Saint-Nicolas. Oh, I can't bear to think of that dreadful place. Why do they leave me here? They know how it frightens me to be left alone. Harold enters, dressed as in first act, from door right. His manner is excited. Dorinda, running to him. Oh, Harold, I am so glad you have come. Ah, Dolly. Yes, oh, I am late, but I couldn't get back earlier. Old Ribot has returned. Ribot, the head of the firm, a hard-fisted, hard-hearted, grasping old miser, and has been overhauling all the factory books. Ha, <laughs> I have him worried, but I give my keys up tomorrow and then he can have his revenge upon me. What's the matter, Dolly? Nothing. I'm nervous tonight, and feel frightfully off color, that's all. Where is Millie? Dressing. Oh, I'll send her to you. Harold crosses to left and sees Crudel. Why, your father is keeping you company. Dorinda, returning to her seat on balcony. Yes, I've been listening to him. He's been snoring. How jolly. Harold looks down on Crudel. Poor old fellow. Tired, perhaps. Sees flask in his hand. Confound him. At that wretched brandy again. Takes flask from Crudel's hand. This is the old reprobite's master. But what a warm-hearted master. How different to Ribot. Ugh. How cold I feel. Puts flask to his lips and drains it eagerly. That's good. Poor broken-down father-in-law. Do as you please. This is Liberty Hall. Till tomorrow. 
he lets the flask fall upon Crudel, who wakes up and rubs his eyes. Harold goes to opening the left. Millicent comes through the curtains and meets him. Millicent is very prettily dressed for the evening. Harold returned. Has anything occurred? Nothing. That is good news. Go and dress. It is half past nine. Our guests will be here soon. What are you going to do? What plan have you in your mind? That is my secret. Go and dress and, Harold, be happy tonight. Happy? Yes. Trust in me and don't look at me all the evening. Dorinda from Window Right. Is that you, Millie? Yes, Dolly. Harold kisses Millicent and goes out through curtains left. Millicent crosses over to card table and sits left of it. She takes up a pack of cards. Crudel has now thoroughly awakened and is putting the flask to his lips. Not a drain, by gad. And I've slept till I'm chilled. What bad measure Margot brought. Perhaps the woman tipples. Ugh! How filthy! Millicent, from card table. Papa, I want you. Yes, pet. Millicent looks round to see that Dorinda is not listening. Dorinda is still on balcony, but not in sight. With your old friends again, Mill? Millicent, letting the cards run through her hands. These? Yes. Crudel, putting his forefinger on the king. How the old monarch smiles on you. He's glad to see us together again. He's delighted by Gad. Father, I haven't touched a peck since I left you two years ago. For shame, Milly. For shame. They served you so well, too. Patting her head. Ah, it was a blow to me when I lost ye. What an eye you had. What a wrist. They used to say you had ten fingers to each hand. Hush, father. Dorinda's a fool to you. A well-meaning girl, but an empty-headed, brainless fool. Whimpering and wiping his eye. She has been a tax upon me. A drain. I've lost by her. Lost by her. She was always in need of new boots and new gloves with hundreds of buttons. I went down lower and lower when you left me. What was it the devils used to call you, Mill? I don't know. I forget. Money spinner, my pet goldfinch. Money spinner, my ladybird. Oh, no. Father. It's true. You know the science. How your tongue used to rattle and how your eyes sparkled. The boobies stared at your face, and you fleeced them. And then you broke your poor old father's heart, and left him alone with a chit of a chit who never brought in a sou and always grizzled for new gloves and new boots with hundreds of buttons. Father, I wonder if I have forgotten the old trick. If my eyes have grown dim and my fingers thick and clumsy. Not you, my cherub. Not you. It's a gift of providence and never leaves one. Crudel goes round to right of table and takes up the pack of cards. Are you going to play tonight, Milly? Perhaps. What? If I play, écarté. Ah, ay. Shall I refresh your memory, eh? Father. Shall I, eh? Shall I? Yes. 
Crudel stands facing Millicent with his back to the audience. The pack he holds is prepared for business. Crudel, taking out King of Hearts and holding it up. The King of Hearts, Mill. I love him. He is so kind to me. See? He is supposed to replace the card, then shuffles vigorously. Who is to have him, Mill? You or I? Give it to me, father. Greedy girl, greedy girl. Her father's own child. He deals five cards to each, three at a time, and then two. The King of Hearts, which, after shuffling, he has made the bottom card of the pack, he deals to Millicent. Show em, Millie, show em. Millicent turns the cards face upwards and takes from them the king, which she holds up. There he is, there he is. That's the way to deal, Mill, that's the way to deal. Yes, two years ago, Dad, not now. Dorinda appears at right window and comes down to back of table. Why not now, Millie? Only two classes of people are lucky at cards. The fools and the knaves. The fools because of their blind courage. The knaves because of their skill. If you are not certain that you are a fool, my child, take your old man's lesson to heart and play with a science. Dorinda sternly. Now then, Pa, shut up. Ugh, you vulgar child. I know I'm vulgar. In appearance, dress, manner, everything. It is in my blood, and it will never come out of it. I know I'm vulgar, but I'm going to be honest. How dare you say such things to Millicent? How dare you preach your dreadful sermons to an honest man's wife? Dear, the way the offspring speaks to the author of her sublunary existence. Go away. I will not. Don't anger father, Dolly. I will anger him because he angers me. Children are children only as long as they know no better than their parents. When they do know better, the parents become their children's children and are to be whipped and stood in the corner. Be silent, or you'll break my heart. Margot enters door right, followed by Ken Gussie. Margot is in black with cap and apron, Ken Gussie in evening dress. Lord Ken Gussie! Margot goes out. Ken Gussie kisses Dorinda and shakes hands with Millicent. How are you, Dolly? To Millicent. How are you, Mrs... Oh, confound it, there's the name again. I heard it on the stairs. To Crudel. Good evening, Baron. Ah, can go see. You see us once more together. Three happy birds chirping in the same nest. Wiping his eye. A pretty picture, I venture to think. A pretty picture. Can Gussie, looking at Dorinda. Very. Harold will be down directly. Can Gussie, to Dorinda. Let us look at the stairs. I, I mean stare at the stars. Dorinda takes his arm to Millicent. Will you be a stargazer, Millie? Boycott. Of course, Millie, boycott. Certainly, I will. Dorinda, Ken Gussie and Millicent go up to window left. Crudel shakes his fist at Dorinda. She looks over her shoulder, sees him, and makes an ugly face at him. They go out on balcony. Let the girl be careful, or I will dismiss her from my affections. Laying his hand on his heart. I feel a vacuum here already, here and elsewhere. I wonder whether there is a loose sandwich or two in the next room. It is my natural disposition to pray. P-R-E-Y. 
I will prey upon the victuals, by gad. He goes quietly out through curtains left. Margot enters, door right. Monsieur Faubert. Faubert enters in evening dress. Millicent advances to meet him. They shake hands. Margot at door, looking at Faubert. I ate him. He kissed me on the stairs, almost against my will. I am fifty years old, so it is not for love. He has a motive. Mon Dieu, I do hate him. Millicent to Margot. Margot, the curtains. Music. Millicent comes down with Faubert. Margot exits to left. To Faubert. Mr. Boycott returns so late. He will be down soon. Margot draws the curtains from across opening left. The room beyond is well lighted, and the end of a supper table is seen laid for supper. Here he is. Harold enters through opening in evening dress. Margot goes out left. Ah, forbear. Very glad to see you. Dolly, can Gussie? Can Gussie comes down, followed by Dorinda. Faubert bows to them. There's something laid in the next room. On condition that nobody dignifies it by the toil of supper, I propose we go and look at it. Millicent takes Ken Gussie's arm. Faubert bows to Dorinda. She takes his arm. They go laughing and chatting through the opening left, followed by Harold. Margot appears left, drops the curtains, then retires left. After a pause, Crudel enters through the curtains, with a sandwich in one hand and a claw of lobster in the other. I can't stand that Frenchman's eye. The fellow has a look that would open an oyster. He sits on Ottoman left. There is a burst of laughter from further room. Eating. They are getting on tolerably well without me. Margot comes from left carrying a tray towards right. Crudel stops her. Be good enough to fetch me the least drop of brandy. Stay, bring the decanter and I'll measure it myself. Yes, I will. She goes through the curtains off left. How men can eat without drinking, I never can understand. The idea, to me, is dog-like and revolting. Margot returning with decanter and glass on tray. Crudel takes decanter, removes stopper, sniffs the contents. Margot holding out glass to him. See glass. No, thank you. I have all I require. Margot points to the decanter and pantomimes by raising her hand to her mouth, that she knows he will drink out of it. Oh, yes, I see. Bravo. A very good idea. Ha, ha. She goes out right. What is the matter with the woman, I wonder? I suppose I have noticed her beyond the requirements of her station. Vanity. Vanity. He takes out the flask from his pocket, and commences to fill it from the decanter. Millicent and Kangussie enter from left and stroll over to window right, not observing Crudel. It is too warm there. It does suggest the tropics. Oh, what a delicious breeze. They stand looking out of window right. Crudel sees them, and while their backs are turned, sneaks off with the flask and decanter out of window left. He gets between the two windows out of sight. Millicent and Kangussi turn down stage right. Kangussi down right centre by table. Here are the cards. Shall we play? Do you... do you wish to play? I should like to, for the sake of old times. We'll play then. For the sake of old times. Millicent sits right of table. Ken Gussie faces her. Dorinda appears left, looks at them. They do not observe her. Face to face once more. 
two old enemies two old friends is their friendship at cards did you read that a brother and sister twins stabbed each other at the saint sever last week over a game of faro what's a warning to all twins are you ready for you to stab <laughs> for me to cut same thing they cut the cards <clears throat> our old stakes if you please or double them two years rest makes one reckless double em millicent deals why how your hand trembles <sighs> the air is so warm here don't notice me it is nothing they play as at a carte Kangussi marks the king dorinda watching from left i made up my mind in the railway carriage when we were leaving paris that i wouldn't be jealous and i thought i was as firm as a rock but oh i have such a sickening sensation at my heart when i see them together why you are positively allowing me to win i shall be proud of my skill after tonight i promised you your revenge aside i can't play tonight putting her hand to her head i think i'm going mad oh harold harold can gussie to millicent coupe marks millicent cuts cards can gussie deals what are you playing can gussie a carte dorinda going up to piano two or company three or none millicent to can gussie je propose combien trois millicent discards can gussie redeals dorinda aside how wrong of milly to allow ronald to play he is such a fool at a card table to can gussie coming down center ronald can gussie does not hear millicent plays a card can gussie triumphantly playing a card le roi ah oh, good gracious ronald is winning fortune smiles on me i kiss my hand to fortune for she is a woman ay and as false as her human sisters Faubert and Harold enter from left, smoking cigarettes and chatting. Harold sits left. Monsieur Faubert. Faubert advancing to her. Miss Crudel. I'm a cigarette smoker. Faubert takes out cigarette case. Isn't it horrid in a woman? Not at all. Gives one and lights it by his. Dorinda aside. I'll do anything to annoy Ronald tonight. He makes me mad. Pause. Millicent reprovingly. Dorinda, what are you doing? Enjoying myself. Can Gussie turning towards her? No, I said, Dorinda. You know I hate that. Thanks, but we are not particularly intent upon pleasing each other tonight. She goes up to left window and sits. Harold to Fober left. Do you bet? Never. Can Gussie over his shoulder to Harold. I am enjoying my revenge for long ago. You'll never believe it. I'm the poorest player in the world, and I triumph. Dorinda from window. Harold, I want you. Harold joins Dorinda and sits. Faubert aside. Madame seems disturbed. Millicent throwing down cards. Oh, what frightful ill luck! Poor Millicent. Millicent tears a leaf from the pocket book and writes on it an IOU and gives it to Ken Gussie. A thousand francs. Aside my only hope is going from me oh, we are lost thanks are you tired millicent rising herself <laughs> not i i'll play till i vanquish you tired 
double the stakes. Millicent rings the bell which stands on the card table. There is a crash of broken glass heard from outside window. Good gracious! What is that? It is that kills my goal. Yes! Crudel enters uneasily through window left. Don't be alarmed, my children. A window in the neighbourhood, I think. Nothing more serious. I didn't know you were there, Papa. Margot enters from right. Yes, madame? Carts, Margot. Quick. Yes, madame. Margot crosses to opening left. As she is leaving, Crudel pulls the skirt of her dress. Margot, my dear, I've had a trifling mishap with a decanter. You'll find it in the court below. Margot laughs. Don't laugh, you vixen. Don't laugh. Margot laughs and goes out left, followed by Crudel. Fulbert, back of table to Millicent. Does Madame often play écarté? No, not now. Madame is wise, for the stakes are high, and fortune is her enemy. Yes. Can Gussie to Fulbert. You'll see. Luck will change. Millicent, staring forward. Perhaps. Faubert goes to desk, right, takes up book, and stands watching. Margot re-enters, carrying a tray on which are two packs of cards, a siphon, a small decanter of brandy, and soda water glass. Margot to Millicent. The cards for Ecarte, madame. Millicent takes cards, giving the two old packs to Margot. Ken Gussie pours himself out a soda and brandy. Margot then withdraws right. Millicent, taking a fresh pack. Coupé. They cut. Millicent deals. As she does so, a card falls unnoticed from the pack and lies at her feet. Fulbert is right by desk. He sees the card upon the ground, is about to call attention to it, but restrains himself. Ken Gussie, playing a card. I play. They play. Fulbert watches them. Ken Gussie, taking a trick. No. Millicent, aside. I must win. I must win. Ken Gussie plays again. Millicent covers his card. He takes the trick. Ken Gussie triumphantly. Another! Millicent aside. Ruin! Ken Gussie plays. Un grand coup! Ken Gussie raises his glass and drinks to Millicent. To my victim! Millicent bows. Ken Gussie drinks. Millicent aside. If he only knew what tomorrow will bring me. At this moment, Dorinda from up the stage laughs loudly. Ken Gussie looks round. As he does so, Millicent discovers the card at her feet and picks it up, aside. Ah, the very card. She plays it quickly, thrusting one of the cards she holds in her hand into her pocket. Voila. Ken Gussie looks round. By Jove, the luck has turned. Ken Gussie, Ronald. Yes? I... nothing. Aside. What have I done? What have I done? Your play, Miller. They continue the play. Faubert crosses to centre, eyeing them. Faubert, aside. Ah... Uh. I thought Madame Boycott's luck would change. She turns the table on the fall of a Scotch lord. Grognon, will you be fooled too by pretty Madame Boycott? How do I stand? My friend Boycott is sorely in need of money, and tomorrow should fall into my hands. I cannot spare him. I am too proud of my glorious 
my useful profession to let him slip now i must have my friend boycott ken gussie throwing down cards or turn desserts me he tears up millicent's i o u then takes note from pocket-book and pushes them to millicent your game a thousand francs again we'll make a night of it forbear aside a thousand francs out of ten and madame boycott's luck returned sits on chair left if madame boycott wins ten thousand francs from lord ken gussie to-night my friend boycott meets his liabilities to-morrow and i lose my pretty little case i cannot spare my friend boycott i will warn the fool of a scotch lord he takes out a pocket-book tears a leaf from it and writes dorinda rises to harold what feverish verses you used to send to milly in your courting days harold by her side did i dorinda coming into room do you remember some lines you begged me to lay upon her pillow the night you thought she had thrown you over she had had a bilious attack and wouldn't see you oh, i remember milly's illness i don't remember the verses i do she took them with a sidelet's powder they began my fate is cursed if i do live without thee to-day to-morrow bind but a single golden raven auburn hair about me and i must follow i forget the rest she plays an air softly on the piano pause Fulbert moves deliberately over to Ken Gussie, who is playing intently, and lays the little note before him on the table. A pardon me, Lord Ken Gussie. That is a nice method of marking at a carte. Read it. Ken Gussie, absently, not looking up. Thank you. Fulbert returns to sofa can gussie plays a card stop i didn't intend to play that <laughs> too late can gussie throwing down his cards once more i thought fortune was only flirting with me again they cut cards millicent commences to deal can gussie picks up forbear's note what is this he reads i don't quite comprehend who placed this upon the table monsieur forbear did he not what is the matter ken gussie aside reading the note again great heavens i can't i won't believe it ken gussie what ails you ken gussie looking at her fixedly you have made a mistake in your play a mistake you know it i can read that you know it in your face i will play no more what do you mean why do you look at me like that can gussie raises his glass to his lips and drains it looking at paper i mean that i believe what is written here i'll play no more he is about to rise she seizes his arm show me that paper i will not show me that paper i cannot lord ken gussie ronald give it me please he slowly hands it to her tell me what am i to think she reads it quickly <gasps> is it false or true don't speak to me so harshly pushes the notes towards him take them away from me take them away is it false or true ronald i it is throwing forbear's note to ken gussie believe every word of it if you care to <laughs> her head drops upon the table 
she cries bitterly. Dorinda ceases playing. Harold turns. Millicent! Ken Gussie rises and flings the cards to the ground. You are too clever for me here. Unfool me on all sides. What is the meaning of this, Lord Ken Gussie? It means, Mr. I am rude enough to forget your name for the moment, that I am about to quit your house with a settled determination to enter it again on no account whatever. Thank you. As you please. And that I do not exactly sympathize with the constitution of a household into which a man is lured as a guest to be cheated at play. Dorinda comes from piano to Millicent. Cheated? I repeat, sir, cheated. Dorinda to Millicent. You're a good sister to rob the man I am to marry. Don't you think I am low enough in his eyes as it is without you degrading me still more? Millicent to Dorinda. Oh, Dolly, have pity. You shall prove your accusation, Lord Kingussie. No, I say, do you really think that to your advantage? Crudel enters through curtains left. What is it? Is there anything in dispute, children? Any little point at cards that Papa can settle? That's right, Father. See your girls now. See what your sermons have brought them to. Ugh, you ungrateful child. Harold to Ken Gussie. You are not now in Scotland, my lord. You must answer to me for your language. Certainly. Pointing to Faubert, who is seated quietly on Ottoman left. In company with that gentleman, rise, the writer of that note. Faubert rises calmly. Let me see that paper. Ken Gussie, giving Faubert's note to Harold. By all means. It is marked private. Perhaps I do not understand the Scotch etiquette in reference to a private communication. In Scotland, sir, two persons are necessary to an agreement. I am under no obligation to you to share alone the advantages of your ingenious discoveries. Fulbert inclines his head. Harold reads. Remember that the lady to whom you are at this moment losing your money is the daughter of a notorious blackleg. Crudel goes upstage. Remember also that she was known in Paris in the Rue St. Nicholas by the sobriquet of the Money Spinner. Ply if you choose, she is cheating you. To King Gussie, pointing at Fulbert. This man, my lord, for the last week or longer, has fastened himself upon me and sought my companionship. Tonight he is my guest, accepting my hospitality. Approaching Fulbert. Jules Fulbert. You dog! He strikes Fulbert upon the breast. Fulbert rouses himself for a moment, as if about to return the blow, then regains his composure and remains perfectly still. Son-in-law, don't be hasty. Don't be hasty. You don't know who your precious friend is. I do, and I can tell you. Dorinda! That man's name is not Faubert. He is Pierre Grognon, a detective in the Parisian police. Crudel hastily goes out. Harold, starting back. Oh, what have I done? Millicent, rising. Harold. Can Gussie to Faubert. Monsieur, whatever your name may be, tell me. Have I indeed the honour of meeting a distinguished officer of the Parisian police? It is true. I am Pierre Grognon. What do you hear? Since I am known, I need no longer conceal my mission. I am watching Mr. Harold Boycott, 
a clerk in Rubot's factory, who is suspected by his employer of a crime. Harold sinks on seat at piano and covers his face with his hands. A crime? And you have grasped my husband's hand under the mask of friendship with this in your heart. She sits right. Madame, we fulfil our useful offices under many guises. It is one of the most sublime offices of friendship that it can be employed for the purposes of detection of crime. Monsieur Ribot requested that I should keep my eye upon Mr. Harold Boycott, whose strength of mind he mistrusted, and I have carried out my instructions to the letter. My task would have been a painful one to so sensitive a man as myself had it not consoled me with the society of Madame Boycott. I do not doubt, sir, that you have performed expediently your most miserable duty. Advancing to him. May I ask you, as a personal favour, that you will step outside that door? Pointing to right. And remain there? Looking at watch. For about a quarter of an hour? Goes to doors, right. As far away from the keyhole as is consistent with your habits and your employer's instructions? I am happy in being able to oblige you. Goes to doors, right, and then turns. Shall I have an opportunity of paying my adieu to your lordship? I shall doubtless require to see you again. In any case, I shall consider it my duty not to be far away from this spot until tomorrow. With a bow, he goes out through doors right, closing them carefully after him. Can Gussie goes to Millicent, who is down right. Dorinda eyes them. Millicent. Yes. I want to speak to you alone. Dorinda, overhearing, quietly goes on to balcony through window right, unperceived. You see how wretched, how humiliated I am. What more do you wish to say to me? I must speak to you alone. Millicent rises and goes to Harold, who is seated at piano. Millicent to Harold. I have some explanation to give to Lord Ken Gussie, Harold. Will you leave us? Harold rises, kisses Millicent's hand, and goes to left. Harold, at curtains, to Ken Gussie. Lord Ken Gussie, of course, does not intend to quit this house without my knowledge. He goes out, left. Millicent comes down to Ottoman left, and sits. Ken Gussie looks around the room, and appears satisfied that they are alone. What have you to say to me? My dear Millicent. My husband's name is Boycott, Lord Ken Gussie. Thank you. You know my failing. My dear Mrs. Boycott, I did tonight, for the first time in my life, within my remembrance, lose control over my temper. Well? Well, my dear Mrs. Boycott, I knew I should get the name. The consequences are so serious to me as to induce me to hope most fervently that such an occurrence will never repeat itself. <laughs> what is this to me? It may be of interest to you, inasmuch as it explains my foolish outburst at dropping a few hundred francs at that card table. You don't believe, then, what that letter told you? You don't believe that I cheated you at cards? Yes, I do. Upon my honour. Millicent sinks back again. Ken Gussie takes a chair and sits centre. Understand the reason of my annoyance. 
I am annoyed, not because I am cheated at cards, but because I was so weak as to imagine that such a simple fool as myself could ever be anything to a pretty woman but a toy and a pastime. Oh, you don't know. You don't understand. Can Gussie, lighting a cigarette. I do know, and I do understand, that I should have read long since the true character of the girl who, two years ago, cheated me at love as lightly as she tonight cheated me at play, who won from me then a heart which was of value to me as easily as she wins now the wretched money which I despise. Millicent rising. Have pity on me. Have pity on me. Ken Gussie rising and replacing his chair. Oh, if we are to indulge in sentiment, it is I who deserves some pity. When I met you two years ago, I cast aside all prejudices, all conventionalities of opinion. I knew you to be, pardon my plainness, the daughter of a sharper, an English adventurer whose name reeked with ill odour in Florence, Monaco, in Brussels, and who had been driven to an obscure quarter of Paris to eke out a miserable existence with the aid of his two children, his decoys. Oh, this is unmanly of you. This is cruel. But a woman once loved by a man, because in his mind is something apart from all other women, much higher or much lower. I never considered your origin. To me you were as the highest lady in the land. And when you discarded me I had no hard name for you, but thought sadly of myself as of a poor fellow who lacked the qualities which win the love of a good, pure girl. Millicent laying her head upon his arm. Oh, hear me for a moment. Ken Gussie taking his arm from her. A moment, and I shall have finished. This morning I came to you, the promised husband of your sister, poor Dolly. I can never give Dolly the affection I gave you, and she guesses it. But she knows, and you know, that I am an honest man, and will do my duty. I loved Dolly because at odd times her voice had the ring of yours, and her eyes the brightness of yours. I won't hear you speak any more. You... You torture me. I have done. I merely wish to put one question to you. Don't you think you did wrong to make a fool of me at Ecarte? Don't you think I merited something less or something more? That perhaps I deserved at your hands something better? He sits right centre. Smoking his cigarette, Millicent comes to him slowly and lays her hand upon his shoulder. Ronald, I did cheat you at the cards. He inclines his head in assent. I was tempted sorely. You heard what that man Grognon said, that he had been employed by Monsieur Ribot, the head of my herald's firm, to watch him. Yes, rising. I beg your pardon, won't you sit down? Millicent, kneeling quickly. No, let me kneel. I will tell you everything. Harold has used monies which do not belong to him for investment in London. Not with dishonest intent, believe me. He thought to repay the money before the return of his absent employers to Rouen. But the London scheme failed, and all our savings are gone, and we are penniless. Harold had no idea that he was suspected. He is to hand over his books and accounts tomorrow, 
and is in desperate need of ten thousand francs to save himself and his wife from ruin i meant to win ten thousand francs from you at play and heaven forgive me i meant to do it dishonestly Kane gussie sits and takes her hand Mele, why did you not give me the confidence which from a woman i once loved i should have esteemed an honour why did you not come to me and say i can speak to you as i can speak to no other man in the world besides my husband i am in distress will you help me mille why did you not trust me because i was too great a coward to beg of the man whom two years ago i cast off without a word of sympathy or kindness because there is bad blood in me and i am a cheat by nature because to women trained as i have been it is so much easier to sin dorinda who has been listening at intervals comes from balcony through window left ken gussie rising and raising millicent my dear little friend i find that i have been mistaken i know nothing of women i am a bigger fool than i thought dorinda comes down and puts her arm round millicent's waist oh milly dear i shall never forgive myself for having been angry with you dolly dorinda wiping her eyes i was jealous of you milly and i've been listening i never guessed that you were over head and heels in trouble and i'm ashamed of myself dear i am indeed my dear dorinda it is not considered usual i may remark for a young lady to play the eavesdropper yes i know that folks in your station are in the habit of drawing the line somewhere i'm not well bred enough to know where the line is to be drawn and i'm not squeamish advancing centre to ken gussie look here ken gussie you've been making some very disrespectful observations about my pa he's not so good and not so bad as other people's paws but i owe him the luxury of being here at this moment and that's all i care about now don't you think you had better go and leave us to share our troubles amongst us i shall stick to millicent as long as i have breath in my body and you and me i don't think we mix well dolly dear you must give me another chance he holds out his hand to millicent she takes it Milly, it is very womanly to be very weak and the weakness of woman deserves i have been taught nothing but the most respectful sympathy i have never thought higher of you than i do at this moment forgive me for every harsh thing i have said and done i need forgiveness i have nothing to forgive we will not argue that point dolly oblige me by calling your father and mr there goes the name again and milly's husband dorinda goes off left quickly ken gussie crosses to table right and rings bell oh lord ken gussie what must you think of me ken gussie leading her to ottoman i think that your tears distress me beyond measure and i think i know that if you had honoured me by becoming my wife you would had there been such miserable need of suffered as much for my sake as you are now suffering for my friend your husband margot enters doors right did madame ring ken gussie crosses to margot there is a gentleman waiting for me is there not monsieur i forget his name margot looking at ken gussie a gentleman who is here like my lord ken gussie disconcerted well i should hardly have thought however that's the man will you ask him to come up margot 
jerking thumb towards Dor's right. Ha! He's sitting on the stairs outside. Is he? I hope he has caught a very severe cold. Margot laughs, claps her hands and goes off right. Harold enters left, followed by Crudel and Dorinda. Dorinda joins Millicent on Ottoman. Ken Gussie taking Harold's hand. Mr. Uh, Millicent's husband, I want you to allow an old acquaintance to put himself right with you. I want you to forgive my almost unpardonable rudeness. Lord Kingussie? Will you do me the kindness to consider me your friend? There is a cloud hanging over me, a black one. You have yet to learn the story of my folly. I know everything. I know that you are a man in great trouble, and I offer you my sincere sympathies. Thank you, from my heart. And more than this, I demand the right, the right to help you in your difficulties by all means in my power. I have long had a predilection for commerce. Will you consider me your banker? Lord Kingussie, I... Hush! You are under no obligations to me. You are in a scrape today. I may be in one tomorrow. It will then be your right to help me, and I shall not fail to seek you. Crudel presses forward and seizes Ken Gussie's hand. My dear Ken Gussie, any question as to your eligibility for the position of my son-in-law, I now consider removed. I may have had my doubts, but I am sure it will ease your mind when I tell you that your present manly conduct thoroughly convinces me that you are a gentleman. Margot enters, followed by Faubert. Monsieur Faubert. Margot scowls at Faubert as he enters and wipes her lips with her apron. Aside. He has done it once more, mon dieu, how I do hate him. Goes out right. Can Gussie to Faubert. I am sorry to have detained you. Pardon me. You can now, however, go home to bed. My duty to Monsieur Ribot? You can perform, as you have said, to the very letter. But let me satisfy your mind upon one point. Let me tell you, sir, that my friend... Pointing to Harold has incurred no liability to his employers that he will not be able to meet tomorrow to the fullest extent. I congratulate Mr. Boycott. For your method of marking at Ecarte, I thank you. But, understand me, I prefer and shall adhere to the old system. Forbear bows. Ken Gussie advances behind him and touches his arm quietly. If you have a grain of manhood in you, do not breathe a word against the lady who has tonight equally honoured you and me by condescending to be our hostess. I have influence in Paris. You understand me? Perfectly. I shall probably have occasion to see you tomorrow morning. Giving his card. Hotel d'Angleterre. Be with me at ten o'clock. He takes from his chain a handsome hunting watch. Don't be late. Giving watch to Faubert. Don't be late. That is an excellent timekeeper. Let it remind you of our appointment. Good night. Fulbert pockets the watch, goes to door, then turns, inclining his head to Millicent and Dorinda. Madame, Mademoiselle, adieu. 
Mr. Boycott, Baron, adieu. Ah, I do not receive one word, one token. May I beg your consideration? Looks at Harold. I have been struck to-night upon the face. When you all speak and think against me, count in my favour what i suffer in the knowledge that it is my duty alone that forbids me to return that blow to ken gussie au revoir dorinda runs over to ken gussie and throws her arms around him oh ronald you are too good to me but i'll try to be a nice girl for your sake i won't smoke another cigarette and i'll never talk slang and when you see me again you shall find me a regular tip-top lady dorinda this is very humiliating for your father ah dolly when you learn all my faults you'll discover what a good little soul you are margot enters right with Ken Gussie's overcoat and hat. My lord's coat and hat. The right-headed gentleman said I was to bring them up. Confound his impudence. He takes them from Margot and gives her some silver. Thank you. Margot goes out. Good night, Baron. Crudel advances and shakes hands. Be careful of the night air, my boy. I don't think a drop of brandy would do you any harm. Beamingly. After our sad excitement, I don't think a drop of brandy would do any of us any harm. No, thanks. Dorinda assists Ken Gussie to put on his coat. Crudel retires and strolls out through curtains left. Harold advances and takes Ken Gussie's hand. I must seek some other opportunity to tell you what I think, what do I feel. Nonsense. We shall meet tomorrow. I shall delay my departure till you are quite through your difficulties. And by the by, old friend, you and this interesting little city must part company. You must consider my little influence in England quite at your service. Harold grasps Ken Gussie's hand, then turns up stage left. I'll see you downstairs, Ronald, if you promise not to kiss me. I promise? Well, I never! The air of Old Lang Syne is played very feelingly. Ken Gussie advances centre towards Millicent who is seated on ottoman left. I am going, Mele. She rises and comes slowly to him. He takes her hand. Good night. Millicent, hanging her head. Don't say anything to me. I can't bear it. Ken Gussie to Harold. I say, uh, um, Mele's husband. Harold, turning around. I beg pardon? May I claim the privilege of an old friend and a future brother? Harold, with a smile. Of course. Dorinda, who is listening, hides her face with her arm so that she may not see Ken Gussie and Millicent. Ken Gussie takes Millicent's hand and kisses her upon the forehead. For old Lang Syne. Ken Gussie goes up to Dorinda at door right. Crudel appears in opening left, with a wine glass in his hand, drinking to Ken Gussie. The music swells as the curtain falls. End of Act Two. End of The Money Spinner by Arthur Wing Pinero.